My name is Jeremy Austin. From 2011 to 2018, I benevolently volunteered to work with and on behalf of the purported Catholic Sede Vacantist organization known as Most Holy Family Monastery, MHFM, which is owned and operated by the Diamond Brothers who reside in Fillmore, New York. I made initial contact with MHFM via email and corresponded after that on a regular basis with one of their monks named Jerome Torres. During my time with MHFM, my primary task focused on translating their written material from English into French and creating editing French version related videos. All of this work for MHFM commenced after I had first created, on my own volition, the website LaFoy.fr. At the time I was sincerely and deeply involved in the evangelical activism of promulgating what I firmly held to be the one and only traditional faith necessary to obtain salvation. I converted to the Sedevacantist position at the age of 22 after conducting historical and theological research. It was through that research that I became convinced of the validity of the work of MHFM and I opted to support them, without however blindly devoting myself to MHFM's religious hierarchy, the Diamonds. During my time with MHFM, I zealously participated in the dissemination of their evangelical material. But in 2018, several relevant pastoral, human relationship and theological issues questions remain ignored unresolved and or unanswered by the diamonds. After several warnings, I became convinced that severing ties with MHFM was legitimate, in order and completely justified. I present this document as an honest testimony, a warning for you to read and then decide for yourself whether my decision is appropriate. My motives are not based on exacting revenge against MHFM. The reasoning behind the writing of this document remains the same as my initial conversion, that being the love of truth and the earnest desire to serve Jesus Christ and follow the teachings of His Church, and not follow individuals who display narcissistic rather than pastoral behavior, who self-proclaim themselves as being members of a renowned religious order without having the right, the authorization to do so. À trois petits enfants, Francisco, Jacinta, Marto. Numerous internal cases opposing these monks to my person have terminated any and all desire for further correspondence, communication with the MHFM. Grec de l'Ancien Testament. My reason for having opted to remain silent until now was based on the sense of duty, being to suffer in silence so as not to trouble the hearts and minds of the faithful, including my personal friends. I feared that by exposing to them the continued pastoral and theological issues I was having with the MHFM's hierarchy, the Diamonds, that it could possibly not only cause them to definitely give up their support to the monks, but possibly cause them to give up on religion itself. One day I alerted the monks to the existence of a book written by John C. Pontrello against the Sedevacantist position, the Sedevacantist delusion, why Vatican II's clash with Sedevacantism supports Eastern Orthodoxy. When I explained to them my intention of refuting Pontrello's work, they wrote back stating that it was not worth the effort. I found it very puzzling that such a book, devoted to methodically demolishing the objections most often launched against Sedevacantism, explaining in depth the indefectibility of the Church and the Holy See, that the diamonds did not take the matter more seriously. Yet the more I sought to refute this book, which I became aware had been influential in the conversion of many people to Eastern Orthodoxy, the more I realized that its conclusions were logical and obvious. In fact, it gave answers to all the frustrating questions that I had accumulated over the years, which had gone unanswered by the monks due to the absence of any viable pastoral care within MHFM. The more I continued in my attempt to refute this book, the more my irritation, anger, increased towards the premise held by the partisans of Pontrell. For, if true, it would have meant that the Roman Church I sought to defend had failed in its mission, which for me was impossible. Indeed, if John Pontrello is right, then the Church of Rome has defected. But since I was and still am convinced that it is impossible for the Church of Jesus Christ to defect, to be defeated, it means that it still exists, alive and well, but not as the diamonds purport it to be. As a Sedevacantist, what I was constantly explaining to people is that before all else, what makes up the papacy and the Catholic Church is its papal office in conjunction with the Holy Spirit and not just the person who sits in the chair of St. Peter as the Pope. 
John Pontrell's book, however, refutes this assertion point by point, proving that the definitions of the papacy do not revolve solely and exclusively around this papal function. Conversely, jurisdiction, charisma and unity must be interrelated and the phenomenon of the succession of persons on the throne of St. Peter must be in perpetuity so as not to contradict Catholic dogmatic teaching. Reading 1873 encyclical of Pope Pius IX, Et si multa, makes it clear that the arguments pronounced in the condemnation and anathema of the partisans against papal infallibility, who held that the Roman pontiff and all bishops, priests and faithful joined to him in the unity of faith, had fallen into heresy by endorsing the conclusions of an ecumenical council of the Church, apply equally to the sede vacantes of today in schism with Rome, because of their rejection of the Episcopal declarations made at the Second Vatican Council. What was reproached to those partisans against papal infallibility by Pope Pius IX in 1873 was a condemnation of schism for their denial of the indefectibility of the Church. John Pontrell's book completely refutes the Diamond's argument and proves that their interpretation, understanding, is erroneous and incomplete. It's as if they wanted to hide any real questions that would jeopardize their position. Sede Vacantis could object, stating that at Vatican II, Paul VI was already an anti-pope before his validation of the council. But the point is that the date of such an affirmation does not matter. For anyone who calls himself a Catholic and thinks that he is no longer in communion with the Holy See has only two solutions, as John Pontrello points out. Either he is in error or there has been a defection. Still, according to the same person, one should not ask the question of how long the Church can last after failing. The Sedevacantis theory of a long exceptional period of interregnum is only a distraction from all that is advanced on the true definition of the indefectibility of the Church. That true definition is referenced in Pontrello's book and is based on information taken from the Catholic Encyclopedia and the writings of a number of renowned Catholic apologetics and refutes the private interpretation espoused by the diamonds. The logic is that if we continue to hold Diamond's position, which can be summed up as saying that we can live without the Roman pontiff, then we must ask ourselves this question. If it's been 57 years since the Catholic Church did not need a Roman pontiff, then how would a Roman pontiff become necessary the following year? This is what the author of the book says on page 73, and it makes sense. Sede Vacant, it's come to you with the famous quote used by the Diamonds on La Salette. Rome will lose the faith and become the seat of the Antichrist. But you can then ask them to explain the other passages within the same message that they do not mention that contradict Sedevacantism. Sedevacantis will bring up the argument used by the diamonds quoting Saint Athanasius. Even if the Catholics faithful to tradition are reduced to a handful, they are the ones who are the true church of Jesus Christ. And you should reply that the presupposition of this great saint were not those of the diamonds. Indeed, they were consistent with the indefectibility of the Church. Saint Athanasius lived at the time when the East and West Churches were not separated and formed one Catholic Church. That is why the idea at that time of losing a very large percentage of Roman Catholics, along with their bishop, was not contradictory to the Universal Church. When I told you that I had warned the MHFM monks concerning John Pontrello's book and did not receive a relevant response, I also wish to point out that a similar issue occurred years ago on the subject of invincible ignorance, which Peter Diamond denounces and claims to have refuted in his book Outside the Catholic Church There is Absolutely No Salvation. I had personally informed him of Singulari Quidem, the letter to the Austrian bishops of March 17, 1856. Note that it is Quidem and not Quadam or Quadem. Peter Diamond quotes Quadam on page 107 of his book, but not Quidem. That error was drawn to my attention by an MHFM opponent who alerted me. Peter Diamond responded to me by email, stating that this passage was clearly heretical and that he would deal with it later. Such negligence to correct an obvious error should act as a wake-up call to the defenders of Diamond's book. Here is the quote from Pope Pius IX on invincible ignorance, pronounced two years after the publication of his encyclical that Diamond claims to have explained in his book. This hope of salvation is placed in the Catholic Church which, in preserving the true worship, is the solid home of this faith and the temple of God. Outside of the Church, nobody can hope for life or salvation unless he is excused through ignorance beyond his control." Quote. To remain consistent, 
Peter Diamond should have reacted and openly condemned Pope Pius IX for heresy, to coincide with his book's accusation of the Pope being weak in his stance on salvation. I believe you will agree that MHFM's rigid position on the issue of invincible ignorance should have placed Pius IX's statement in singular equidem in a far more precarious position than that of simply being weak especially since the issue of invincible ignorance is fiercely criticized and condemned by Diamond as being a proof of apostasy for whoever would dare to hold that position today. One only has to look through the chapters of his book on invincible ignorance to realize this. Why should Pope Pius IX, the one who wrote the syllabus of errors, escape the generally harsh condemnations attributed by the Diamonds to all such heretical anti-popes? Spared by the Diamonds' obviously confused state, Pius IX should have been hit with the condemnation of heresy years before presiding over the First Vatican Council, 1870. If we reflect back to the Sedevacantis argument used to legitimatize their separation from the Vatican II signatory, Paul VI, namely that Paul VI was already a heretic before Vatican II, then how can it be that one can ignore Pius IX's similar heretical status and thus the legitimacy of the First Vatican Council? To remain consistent, the Sedevacantis should at least question the validity of the pontificate of Giovanni Maria Ferretti, Pius IX. By the way, it is interesting to note that during the proclamation of the dogma on papal infallibility by Pius IX at Vatican I, numerous lightning bolts struck the dome as well as other parts of St. Peter's Basilica, which then did not have a lightning rod attached to it. The theory of the end time according to MHFM and more exactly of the similar event of lightning striking St. Peter's Basilica during the reign of Benedict XVI, should logically remain consistent with that of Pius IX. But perhaps some conveniently choose to play ostrich, sticking their head in the sand so as not to have to consider and recognize the anti-pontificate of Pius IX. For if Pius IX was declared to be an anti-pope, it would reduce to ashes numerous claims and statements presented on the Diamond Brothers website. Months after the John Pontrolo book debacle, I came across a video about Sedevacantism that was created by a man named Jay Dyer. Its content captured my undivided attention and combined with the teachings found in his other related articles and videos, I became convinced he was stating fact. I will address the video on Sedevacantism later on as it deals with the human relations aspect of Sedevacantism which, as mentioned before, poses a devastating argument against this position. I prefer instead to focus on a crucial theological doctrine, the essence-energy distinction. The Diamonds have released a video against this orthodox doctrinal position in the hope that by doing so, it will calm their troubled flock, those sheep they have thus far managed to rustle and herd into the coral of Sedevancatism. This type of video attack is a common self-serving tactic used, rather than requesting an actual debate, against those orthodox evangelicals the diamonds denigrate as being Eastern schismatics and or the so-called orthodox. When referring to adherents of Eastern orthodoxy following the great schism of 1054, which separated the Roman and Eastern Catholic churches. At the time, I had not paid any real attention to the theological topic of the essence-energy distinction. But after listening to Jedire and reading and studying his material, I came to the realization that it wasn't the Orthodox, but rather the Diamonds, who did not know what they were talking about. At first, I merely suspected the Diamonds of being intellectually dishonest. But after the release of their second video against Orthodoxy, I knew my suspicion of their dishonesty was in fact correct as they attacked Jedi's stated positions on the subject without naming him. Their commentary under their first video against the Orthodox is an expressed admission of their bad will. That quote is clearly referring to Jedi, even if they do not name him. His journey into Orthodoxy aligns with what the Diamonds reports, although the slanderous accusation and skewed tone does not reflect at all the reality of the events that Jedi mentions in the video describing the stages of his eventual conversion to Eastern Orthodoxy. The accusation that Jedi does not provide references to the sources he uses in his videos is a blatant and outright lie. Anyone who has viewed Jay's videos can confirm and attest to this fact. The Diamond Brothers should be ashamed of themselves for bearing false witness against their neighbor, which according to their own words is a mortal sin. Why do you think the Diamonds hid the identity of Jedi in their video? I for one believe it's because they see him as being one of the biggest threats to the continued success of their religious enterprise. It's their strategy to never openly debate with him. 
Jediro would crush Peter Diamond during a real debate. In my opinion, the first video of MHFM on the Orthodox was a vain attempt at removing Jedi as a threat without naming him directly and by maliciously circumventing the actual issue in the hope that those people they hold to be infected by him would abandon their research and interest in Eastern Orthodoxy. When Peter Diamond complains of the misinterpretation of MHFM's position on Orthodoxy concerning the essence-energy distinction, it is nothing more than a diversion tactic. I arrived at this conclusion after spending time going over the MHFM Twitter pages and reading the responses from their followers. This diversion tactic is used as to avoid having to deal with the root cause of the problem. And what about this root cause then? I will avoid using overly technical terms on this subject of the divine essence energy distinction. Several links to some of Jay Dyer's videos and articles are made available at the end of my presentation for this specific purpose. I prefer rather to first synthesize this doctrine to the best of my ability and then to develop my position exposing the weaknesses and errors of the diamond's argument on this subject. So what is this essence energy distinction? The essence of God remains inaccessible to humans. That is why only the energies of God, that is the emanation of the glory of God, can be seen with the non-rational eye of the human mind. The problem, when one speaks of divine essence, is that the Roman Catholic doctrine on the definition to be given to the divine simplicity is absolutist. We then speak of absolute divine simplicity or absolute simplicity. All relationships, actions and all attributes of God are irreducibly identified with its simple nature, that is its essence. It's a simplicity in which one would find neither distinctions nor compositions. The Orthodox believe in divine simplicity, but not absolutist divine simplicity. According to Jedi, the Roman vision of this simplicity was born of Hellenistic assumptions in their dialectic. And if this doctrine owes its success and its anchoring in Roman Catholic doctrine after the first millennium, it is among other things due to the influence of Thomas Aquinas' presuppositions on divine essence that is found in Thomism and Scholasticism. With the issuance of Pope Leo XIII's 1879 encyclical Eterni Patris, Thomism became the official underlying philosophy of the Roman Catholic Church. In 681, the Sixth Ecumenical Council, Constantinople III, dogmatically proclaims the essence-energy distinction in relation to Christ and his two natures. This council had been convinced by the book of Saint Maximus the Confessor in his correspondence with Pyrrhus. The concept of mono-energy is considered anathema. Note that Pope Saint Agatho had written a letter to the Council expressing his favorable conclusions. Moreover, he explained them in explicit detail by literally using the term energy. This shows that this theological point of the distinction between essence and energy was addressed in the dogmatic proclamations of the Third Constantinople Council. Now, for you to understand why it is so important to reflect on this theological point, listen carefully. In the episode of the Transfiguration, when Jesus Christ made manifest the divine light of God on Mount Tabor, was this light created? No, obviously not. In the same way, how could Moses have spoken with God face to face as a man speaks unto his friend if God is an absolutely simple essence? This God who spoke face to face with Moses, was it a hologram? A creation? Remember that the essence of God remains inaccessible to humans. The essence-energy distinction is the explanation of this problem. More precisely, these examples are called theophanies in theology, that is to say divine manifestations. There are numerous examples in the Bible. As Jedi says, these manifestations of God are not created holograms, they are not angels, they are God himself. They are the divine energies of God. Those who persist in believing in absolute divine simplicity will sooner or later find themselves confronting absurd conclusions in Christology. All the actions of God would then become perfectly equal to the divine essence. Christ creating the world would become synonymous with Jesus walking on the water. According to Jedi, such actions would then be only emanations of his essence, leading directly to Neoplatonism. He goes on to say that absolute divine simplicity leads to perennialism, explaining step by step how one arrived at Vatican II and a context in which theologians denied the divinity of Jesus Christ. If what we experience are only holograms or effects created by God, then it means one can never experience on earth a direct link with God. This would lead directly to atheism, for one could never know who God really is. And this while he revealed himself to us on Mount Sinai. Jedi makes his explanation consistent of what God says in Exodus 3.14, I am that I am. It is not the supreme essence, but the Almighty Father who 
presents himself by I am a person, not an unknown syncretist being. All this considered, the Trinity becomes more logical in the relationship to his divine persons. When one recites, I believe in God the Father Almighty, it is to recognize that God the Father is the only cause. Saint Gregory Nazianzus said that everything the Father has, the Son has, except for being the sole cause. Thus there is no double procession of the Holy Spirit. There is only one cause and it is personal, the Father. I hope I have synthesized appropriately the theological point on the energy essence distinction. To try and simplify it further, let me use the analogy, it's like the sun. When we are struck by the warm and soothing rays of sunshine, it is not wrong for us to say that it is the sun itself that makes us feel good. This truth, however, does not deny the fact that there is only one sun that we see in the sky, but which remains inaccessible to us in its center. At this point, we can pass to a short review of the MHFM video on this point. Peter Diamond spoke mostly of the concentration tactics used in prayer practiced by Orthodox monks, called hesychasm. It is as if one were trying to criticize the Benedictine monks Lectio Divina, the order the Diamond purport themselves to belong to, when monks lower their heads to the Bible to meditate and pray. But we do not need to go extremes to refute the diamonds. Mysticism also exists in the history of Catholicism, and it is obvious that the diamonds are attempting another diversion. After reading their recent statements against the Orthodox since the release of their film, I am convinced of that. They apply this diversionary tactic when they happen across a flow, a misstatement, and or a simple misunderstanding expressed by an Orthodox on this very complex subject with its robust technical vocabulary. The diamonds revert to this tactic in an attempt to deflect themselves away from having to respond to and or deal with the logical questions that rise up and stand out about the subject of absolute divine simplicity. Their comparison of orthodox prayer as being a form of yoga is an absurd joke. The orthodox Seraphim Rose correctly believed in the essence-energy distinction and yet wrote an entire book against yoga. I think the diamonds believe they have found a simple but not honorable or glorious way to rid themselves of a problem without risking the annoying problem of losing face. For example, their use of Saint Athanasius marks the end of the debate they lost. Peter Diamond cut out part of a quote in Athanasius' work, De Decretis, to try to prove that this saint would have told the absolute divine simplicity as understood by MHFM. In his video shot live on February 19, 2019, Jedi indirectly refuted the diamonds. Here is what he could have said to Peter Diamond in the middle of a debate, who would have been absolutely embarrassed. So you literally just made a clown fool out of yourself because the entire argument, thank you for handing that to me. You just handed to me the fact that you missed the entire context of the argument of Athanasius against the Arians for wrenching out a paragraph proof text that is perfectly an orthodox statement of divine simplicity, and you miss the whole argument and undercut it by trying to make him into a proponent of Thomism. Utterly stupid. That Catholics accuse orthodox of being polytheists for believing in this doctrine of essence-energy distinction is already an hypocrisy when one claims to believe in the real presence in the Eucharist. The following quote is worth mentioning to dismiss this crude charge. To the philosophical objection that he was introducing a second and lower God beside the unique Godhead, Palamas replied over and over again that no multiplicity of divine manifestations could affect the unity of God, for God is beyond the categories of whole and parts, and while in his essence always remaining unknowable, reveals himself wholly in each energy as the living God. These people do not seem to understand that this doctrine in a manner of speaking which would include the fact that Jesus, the Son of God, is the wisdom of God, does not actually imply a strict identification between nature, hypostasis, and the operation, energy. Jedire says in this regard that to strictly identify the Son of God with the will of God would lead to massive errors and heresies, such as the absurd notion the Son generates himself. He goes on to say that the attributes of God, such as goodness, love, mercy, providence, wisdom, etc., are not absolute definitions of the divine nature, for the divine nature surpasses any singular definition. But that does not mean that when you use an attribute, you do not want to signify God as a whole. For example, if we spoke of Jesus in speaking of his divine nature, it would not be a strict definition of Jesus with his two natures, but it would not be heretical as long as it is believed that Jesus has two natures. Another way to say it, to speak of wisdom or providence by wanting to speak of God, 
is not heretical as long as one does not seek to withdraw the other attributes that belong to God. Once again, I suspect dishonesty on the part of the diamonds, who deliberately keep their supporters in a state of confusion so as to keep control of a situation that otherwise would escape them completely, resulting possibly in the mass exodus conversion of their Sedevacantist base into Eastern Orthodoxy. They and their base are quick to condemn anyone who does not understand immediately that the Novus Ordo new mass should not be attended after consulting their material. If the diamonds apply their own strict principles to themselves when considering the advanced theological expertise they claim to possess, they should at least acknowledge their errors, their lack of flexibility and or their inability to understand the essence-energy distinction. For Jediar, the diamonds are clowns with whom one should not waste one's time. If one assumes that the Trinity is a mystery, those who criticize the essence-energy distinction should be humble if they cannot understand the process as a whole, instead of rejecting everything in its entirety by not correctly distinguishing the words of St. Athanasius. They would do better to focus on the obvious flaws in their reasoning and what they should conclude by clinging to absolute divine simplicity. His essence, he remains unknowable always, but he, he reveals himself wholly in each energy as the living God. So God is wholly present in his energies, even if it's the energy of providence, right? And you say, well, what if, if love and providence and mercy are distinct attributes, then how is God wholly present in each one? That's why it's a mystery, bro. That's why it's a revealed doctrine and not a philosophic doctrine. In fact, an overview would help them to see more clearly. And that's exactly what we need to talk about at this point with papal supremacy. I believe that it would be far more appropriate if the ardent supporters of the monks of Most Holy Family Monastery would refrain from labeling me as an orthodox schismatic before they've actually spent time and acquired some factual-based knowledge on the subject itself. They should ask themselves, what is the actual purported refutation made by the diamonds against Eastern Orthodoxy? Do these brothers really know what they are talking about? Unlike Jediar, it is unequivocal that Peter Diamond knows little to nothing on the subject of the essence-energy distinction. The supposed devastating arguments launched by the diamonds against orthodoxy in their material are far-fetched, as well as minimal. Diamond's article, quoted in part below, affirms a contradiction in MHFM's position on orthodoxy as regards the ecumenical councils. Diamond believes that the pseudo-council of Ephesus II can be compared to a valid council and sees a contradiction in the equal number of bishops present in these two places while one council was deemed heretical and the other not. But it's absurd. For history proves that, although it was in the context of the time that all the councils were eventful, Ephesus too is particularly unique in that many bishops were prevented from expressing themselves concretely, even forced to sign. If this point has been ignored or put aside by Peter Diamond, it is because he does not possess the necessary analytical fineness to understand it and thus remains anchored to his papal-centric presuppositions. The presence of Roman legates, openly opposed to the wrong turn made during the theological debate, should not act to justify transforming the other bishops into their vassals, even if all of them were opposed to this same council, to promote their presiding emissary the Pope into a supreme episcopal emperor. In any case, the structural organization of the Orthodox Church, which functions as a confederation, would be much more difficult to destroy than a centralized organization operating under papal supremacy that is located geographically in only one location, Rome. It would appear that only those Christian faithful occupying the catacombs of Rome are left to resist the wickedness of governments and the uncompromising pagan religion found in that city today. How could the Church go from St. Peter, the humble martyred apostle, and suddenly jettisoned itself into an age where the popes took on the mantle of crown episcopal kings possessing the right, the God-given authority, to install and or depose any and all the emperors of the world? A world in which they now alone controlled? First of all, as Jediah points out, it is impossible that the St. Peter of chapter 15 of the Acts of the Apostles, the very one who is quoted by the diamonds in their video wanting to prove the papacy, fought like Pope Bonifacius VIII in Unam Sanctum. It's impossible. St. Peter did not ask the whole assembly gathered in Jerusalem to submit to him for salvation. According to Jediar, the Orthodox Church is not a giant international bureaucracy. That said, it comes to affect the legal political sphere. 
The false decretals that led to the proclamation of Unum Sanctum are historically recognized as the work of counterfeiters. Only fierce sectarians could accuse those who mentioned this fact of dishonesty in denouncing papal supremacy. I will present for this the following quote. The Ultramontans cannot openly sustain these decretals as true, for it has been abundantly proved that they were manufactured partly from ancient canons with extracts from the letters of the popes of the 4th and 5th centuries. Entire passages, particularly from St. Leo and Gregory the Great, are found in them. The whole is strung together in bad Latin, which for even the least critical scholar has all the characteristics of the style of the 8th and 9th centuries. Who correctly interprets the papal decrees? Answering that a decree is to be read as a definition without departing from the definite meaning does not signify the end of the problem, because each one could still persist in interpreting what he reads in the definition. For Jediar, there is no way to go from Jesus speaking to Peter in Matthew 16:18 to three different guys in Avignon claiming to be successors of Peter. In fact, so that Catholic theologians could explain all this, they had to invent the theory of doctrinal development, with Cardinal John Henry Newman in the 19th century, for example. It is not surprising, then, that we arrived at Vatican II. If Rome had been perceived from the beginning as having universal supremacy, never would Paul have written a letter to the Romans in Peter's allegedly unique jurisdiction, by threatening the faithful, by instructing them, in short, by meddling in what would not have been his business. The problem is not papal primacy, but the claim of universal jurisdiction and papal supremacy. Did you know that Pope St. Gregory the Great had an opinion very hostile to the idea of a patriarch or universal bishop? In fact, he considered as the precursor of the Antichrist whoever would dare to put on such a definition, placing himself above all the other bishops. St. Gregory developed his opinion by quoting St. Paul to the Corinthians, who was horrified by the habit taken by some of claiming to be from such a church, of such a man, as I am of Paul or of Apollos. St. Gregory flatly rejected any idea of universality on his behalf. This hero of Roman Catholics, St. Gregory the Great, is also recognized and revered as a saint among the Orthodox. The bishop of Caesarea and Cappadocia in the 3rd century, St. Firmilian, was chief of the anti-Donatists. After having opposed the Pope of the time, Stephen, he died outside the communion of the Roman Church, but nevertheless remained a saint of the Church. He had used sarcasm against the Pope, reproaching him for his failure to comply with the salutary commandments and warnings of the Apostle, namely to preserve humility and gentleness in a matter in which bishops were unjustly excommunicated by the Pope. St. Firmilian, developing his point of view, had then described Stephen as an apostate of the communion of ecclesial unity. In the 5th century, African bishops wrote in a letter to the Pope at the time that the latter was not entitled to overturn their judgments and that he had no jurisdiction over their lands. And far from thinking of appealing to the Pope of Rome for the holding of a court of appeal beyond the scope of the synodal councils, the African bishops chose the Ecumenical Council. In fact, it should be known that the famous phrase of St. Augustine, Rome spoke, so the cause is over, was only used to express a rejection of the authority of Pope Zosimus to judge a case. The Apostle St. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, called carnal the faithful who claimed to belong to a church belonging to a man, for example to say that they were of Paul or Apollos. In fact, the Apostle to the Gentiles had reiterated what he had written to them earlier, except for one detail, he adds Cephas, Peter, following Paul and Apollos. This sample of information is clearly a proof of a refusal of papal supremacy. Among the Orthodox, there is no one greater than the Bishop Apostle. If Catholics do not like to learn all of this, it is because their entire perspective is guided by their conviction that it is obligatory to have a supreme leader, a Pope in the Church of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ wanted a Pope when he established his Church. In all the works of the monks of MHFM, the argument is based on the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 16:18, in the sense of a promise of papal supremacy. The problem for the diamonds is that the fathers of the church are very numerous not to share their point of view at all. You will find in the links an excerpt giving more details, but to say it briefly, eight fathers think that the stone means all the apostles. Sixteen fathers say that Jesus was the stone of this passage. Moreover, St. Paul calls Jesus the stone in 1 Corinthians 10.4. Those who wandered to Rome and more precisely to the Vatican must have felt embarrassed to have to defend a church that moralizes on sexuality and yet has many statues showing naked bodies in many of its monuments. A hint of hypocrisy should touch your nostrils. 
one didn't have to wait for Vatican II to observe vitiated practices or pedophile attacks in the Vatican. In the 15th century, Pope Alexander VI felt compelled to write a bull of reform to curb the ways of cardinals who sexually abused young children. The worry is that he did not publish it. Richard Imbrani is a former monk of MHFM, who after having broken with them, went back to the 13th century to find antipopes. Here you have another absurdity of the logical consequences of Sedevacantism. But the motivation of Richard Imbrani remains interesting to take into account with the chapter seen above for scholasticism is perceived by him as the responsible for apostasy. It is remarkable that it also remains a vehicle of diffusion for the erroneous doctrine of absolute divine simplicity, as we have seen previously. The method of the ancient monk of MHFM to go back in time to look for the deeds of Pope to criticize, nevertheless allowed him to collect some information that others would prefer seeing hidden to spare a lot of troublesome questions. For example, it is not worthy that Pope Eugene IV commissioned the installation of a huge gateway to St. Peter's Basilica in 1445, where mythological figures stand alongside traditional ones. For the usual objection against orthodoxy, divorce and remarriage, one only has to read what St. Basil thinks, and rethink the hypocrisy of the Vatican, and consider the list of pure men who are single for life, becoming frustrated and children abusers or breakers of vows. As for the filioque, you will be invited to read in the links an article on the subject. Before, note that Pope John VIII signed the document banning the filioque. MHFM's video on the Orthodox is seen in another light. Alongside what has been presented, the Sedevacantist claims appear very weak and can only remain in the shadows, like the dark character of their authors. My arguments having been made, I would like to turn to an analysis of the behavior of the monks of MHFM and their supporters. Sedevacantism, as seen by Jediar, is a world full of spooks, kooks, and crooks. This world of spooks, kooks, and crooks. The crux of his video's message on this subject comes in line with my own experience. I wish to go on record as corroborating the validity of Jediar's analysis and confirm that it does apply to the diamonds. Before continuing, I would first like to acknowledge the presence of the numerous courageous, intelligent men and women found amongst the Sedevacantists. Many of these individuals remain my friends. For those who still vigorously support the monks of MHFM, I am of the opinion that they simply fail to see and or recognize the illicit religious stranglehold the diamonds have placed on them. They do not see that it is exacerbated centralism and not pastoral care which reigns over this alleged Benedictine monastery, ruled over by its leader, Michael Diamond. Those who seek to comply and follow to the letter the demands of the diamonds concerning the sacraments of the Church will admit that it's easier to say than to do. The United States does not mirror the realities existing in the rest of the world. So it will happen that if one seeks to follow the rigid sacramental demands of MHFM, one is left with no other option than to stay home. The isolation then becomes very heavy and leads to a form of toxicity in relationships. I was very hard myself, too hard with the people I unwillingly pretended to be guiding. I always talked about trenches. But it's much easier to stay alone in Fillmore in the USA, where the monks live, more or less far away from any dangerous socio-political context, than in a Europe that is deteriorating day by day or in another corner of the world. Imprudence, or should it be said, deceit, that I perceive in their advice to know how to receive the sacraments, push people to adopt at least abusive attitudes of the kindness and patience of these few pro-Vatican II priests who accept to confess the one who continually treats them as heretic and who does not support his chapel. During my seven years of service with MHFM, I repeatedly observed and experienced the lack of civility, the application of common courtesy, and above all else, the lack of any semblance of true pastoral care. Stephen Sperry had debated against Peter Diamond concerning baptism and was shocked and dismayed by Diamond's behavior. The monk called him late at night, setting unrealistic self-serving conditions intended to ensure that the outcome of the debate would end up in his favor. Yet this is not the first time Peter Diamond has employed such deceitful tactics to ensure the outcome of a scheduled debate. No matter what side of the baptism of desire issue that you are on, the behavior of Peter Diamond remains not only inappropriate and unacceptable but scandalous. The Diamond's position of the end times explains, for the most part, why they legitimatize the use of such an isolating, insulting behavior. It is believed that in these exceptional times that exceptional measures are justified and warranted. Yet, for the Diamonds, the exception eventually becomes a rule. 
Concerning the end time, I would encourage you to consider a hypothesis that the end times kings of the apocalypse were actually referring to the last kings of Judea, and that the warnings Christ stated in Matthew 24 were not prophetic prediction concerning our day, but rather prophesying the sack of Jerusalem in 70 AD. An in-depth article of this hypothesis is found in the links section of this document. In short, if the diamond's end times position proves itself to be pure conjecture on their part, then the MHFM collapses. Over the years, I have witnessed the escalation of Diamond's confidence in the end times. It is as if their use of the word could, the conditional tense used to say that one would be free to reject their theory, is actually false, and that one must adhere to their position or risk of being rejected by MHFM. Their conditional use of could is actually cleverly inserted injunction. The Diamonds do the same with praying the rosary. Whenever they recommend praying the rosary to people, their use of you should pray is skewed as it is intended to exert pressure on the individual to complete all 15 decades per day. I once spent whole nights praying the rosary over and over, knowing full well that in the morning I had to go to work. It was an exhausting process required by the monks, who often seemed to me to be disconnected from reality. I want to make it clear that everything I told and instructed others to do, like saying the 15 decades of the rosary each day, I did it myself. Note that I've come to realize that this insistent transmission to individual of the necessity of performing such everyday sleep deprivation, conversion, procedures, is synonymous with the practices found with mind control cults. It suffices to observe the relentless devoted efforts of MHFM's faithful base to confirm that what I have said is true. Having spent consecutive days and nights translating the work of the monks, I have come to know and recognize their writing style and can easily identify very specific linguistic characteristics. It is amazing to observe their same retorts and keywords utilized by their faithful base who comment on various social media outlets. MHFM's faithful base have literally become parrots, nauseatingly true copies, clones of the diamonds, using the same frigid tone, absent of the second degree of charity they themselves define. To insult of heretics everyone one meets, it is more or less what happens because it appears that it is not enough to convert to the true faith the neighbor, but especially to convince him to all the positions of the diamonds, as would do a cult. I would encourage these individuals to remember that Apollos was a disciple of Saint Paul and evangelized by his side without first being baptized. MHFM would find it difficult defending this historical fact, as, according to their writings and the professed opinions of their peers, they would to think long and hard before even saying hello to anyone who has not been baptized. The impression I'm left with after seven years of observation within MHFM is that few there are within that alleged religious community who would be capable of recognizing any of the righteous found in the Old Testament if they were not already named and most certainly would criticize and condemn any evangelical who showed the same charity today that Christ bestowed upon the sick, the sinner, and the Samaritans. There are some members of MHFM who have a certain predisposition to ultimately one day choose a monastic life, residing in total isolation from the outside world. I met people matching this description, but it would be a mistake to ignore the non-monastic laity or to force them to be on the same level as them in matters that are unrelated to their obtaining salvation, according to the diamonds. Let's take a look at the behavior on social media that some Diamond supporters display. Browsing the Catholic True account on Twitter is as good a place to start as any. If this Catholic True turns out not to be Peter Diamond writing this debased stuff, then it's as true a copy of him that there may ever will be. Yet if it's him, as I rightly or wrongly suspect, then it's stupefying that Jed Dyer can be faulted by Diamond for the number of religious changes he has made in his life. It is reckless and ignoble on the part of Catholic truth to infer that Dyer changes religion as often as he changes his socks. It's hypocritical, as Catholic truth does not seem to remember that MHFM once condemned the use of Christmas trees, but later changed their minds. I myself participated in the translation into French of the original. This has caused me problems with my own family, and it is a shame to learn years later that this could have been avoided. The Diamonds have no excuse in not agreeing to and are sticking with the information they disseminate. It is also an example of the consequences of their way of meddling and interfering with anything and everything rather than spending their time in prayer and contemplation, which is the traditional obligation of Benedictine monks. Jedire makes a connection between autism and sedevacantism, that these individuals are unstable in their frantic search for a utopian ideal. Speaking from experience, Jedire states that at 20 years of age, I was very idealistic and I assumed that there would be a perfect system that I could map onto reality uh, and when I didn't find everything matching up to this perfect intellectual system, 
became very frustrating because it eventually leads to a kind of despair because there's just you and nobody else, right? And eventually your friends don't want to interact with you and you don't have any friends and you're very alone, but you feel like you would be engaging in a mortal sin if you dared to do anything outside of the strictures of whatever your little cult told you. I concur with Jediar and have similar stories I could share. Generally speaking, we find in Sedevacantism, and especially in those who gravitate towards MHFM, people who lack flexibility, who panic as soon as the realities associated with that religious scenario fail match up with their expectations. I know all too well the truth of that statement. As far as my relationship with the monks is concerned, I admit to having received some rash emails from Peter Diamond. Yet there are stories of those who actually lived at the monastery in Fillmore, New York, and are interacted directly with them. Richard Inbrani is one such a former MHFM monk who evoked in his personal testimony numerous accounts in accordance with what I've been stating. The current positions held by this former monk should not rule out in the validity of the statements made in his audio recording, although one needs to proceed with a rational sense of caution. It is interesting to note some of the frustrations and our observations expressed by many people who have been in direct contact with the diamonds for an extended period of time in order to provide us with a more accurate understanding of the disturbing behavior found within MHFM. Richard Inbrani spoke in particular of the total lack of charity of the diamonds during his time at the monastery, in addition to the overall lack of interest in their providing true pastoral care. There is the testimony of a young girl relating the story of when she and her family visited MHFM that confirms, unequivocally, a sense of uneasiness in the behavior of Fillmore's monks in general. MHFM was deemed to be unfriendly by this family, though not direct criticism was made of them. Although several days later the family received an email from the Diamonds threatening them with the hellfire and damnation if the girl did not stop wearing jeans. If the story is true, such action clearly demonstrates the diamonds complete disconnection from reality and further proves that the diamonds do not apply in the real world what they proclaim loud and clear in their virtual one. It is also interesting to note that the monastery is the source of several internal schisms, for example with the old monks Richard Imbrani or John Venari. This confirms another analysis by Jedi about the logical flow in which Sedevacantism leads which brings together in groups several strong personalities who are victims of an overly imposing ideal. The diamonds are known to have encouraged certain of their followers to literally hate their own family members by misquoting, misinterpreting the words of Jesus Christ found in Luke 14.26. I certainly prefer the biblical commentary found in the Orthodox Study Bible, which states the exact opposite of what the diamonds conclude. The command to hate one's kindred and his own life also is not to be taken literally. The passage is not to be taken literally. Peter Diamond is the first to say that the biblical quote of tearing one's eyes to stay away from hell is not literal. Where does come off thinking that it is MHFM who chooses which biblical passage dealing with hate can be taken literally and which cannot? Peter Diamond's interpretation of the use of the word hate in Luke 14.26 goes directly against God's fourth commandment to honor thy mother and father. And there are many other passages within the Gospels that repeat this particular verse but do not use the word hate at all. How can we speak about the good fruits of MHFM when we see such evidence of debased evangelical behavior? Jedi rightly expresses that point in his own experience, where people became atheists 10 years after being set of accountist upon realizing the absurdity of the position. All of this considered, I now hold the opinion that MHFM is a hate group who have structured a form of mind control, whether these monks realize it or not. It's an organization that has managed to transform a lot of people into hate-filled and enraged fanatics that are then unleashed upon the internet. Where is the living church when we look at these diamond-dyed salvancantists? How to explain such an attitude? A traditional Catholic priest with whom I conversed with in October 2018, Father Grassili, gave me a number of arguments as to why the diamonds do more harm than good, even if their intention is based on the goodwill of promoting the Catholic faith. We agreed to treat them as being journalists of sorts, for they have somehow forgotten the primary duties and responsibilities associated with being monks and who, if they were to submit themselves to a bishop, would undoubtedly be most embarrassed and uncomfortable in having to obey him. Simply reading Pope Pius XI's encyclical Mortalium Animus should be enough to convince anyone that Vatican II broke cleanly away from following Catholic tradition. 
and that implies that we actually don't need any more journalists, like the Diamonds, informing us of the obvious. From top to bottom, MHFM is filled with people untrained in the rigors associated with the monastic spiritual life. In view of this undeniable evidence against the monks, one should ask themselves, does MHFM merit to be considered a true order of Saint Benedict? Evangelicals like John Pontrell, Jediar, and many others like them can hardly be compared to the Diamonds, for none but the Diamonds claim to be acting on a question of eternal life or death, salvation. For those of you who have visited the monastery's website, have you noticed the absence of any in-depth information relating to its founding, its current hierarchy, and or more importantly, the life and times of MHFM's founder, Joseph Natal? There are some things you need to know. Natal proclaimed that he had spoken with and was chosen by God, who informed him that his monastery would be the beacon of all Catholicism, the forerunner of the second coming of Christ, and the final religious order in the world. It has been inferred by certain individuals who met Joseph Natal that stated and believed that the end of the world would occur sometime in 1999 and that Jesus would return. Natal had declared to a number of people that he was chosen to be a witness of the second coming of Jesus Christ, but it never happened since Joseph died unexpectedly in November 1995. Michael Diamond's brief mention on the website of Joseph Natal's past claims and alleged vision is a vain attempt to give prestige and credibility to his monastery by inferring that MHFM has remained steadfast and on the same straight line since its inception. But that is not true. The founder of MHFM has always been against Celebacantism, and so was Michael Diamond in 1996, pursuing Joseph Natal's initial will, before changing positions shortly after the conversion of his blood brother. To Peter Diamond's own admission, in his video intended as a defense of his older brother, Michael Diamond was too young to pretend to take the place of superior of the Order of Saint Benedict in the monastery. With testimonies like that of Richard and Brani and others, the arguments used by the Diamonds against them are no more convincing and are of the type, trust us, these people are lying. One additional point, Joseph Natal was handicapped since childhood, a condition that automatically denied him the possibility of ever becoming a Catholic priest, due to the rigors associated with carrying out the functions of the priesthood. Yet, that fact did not stop him from declaring and presenting himself as MHFM superior, a position that only a professed and ordained member of the priesthood is allowed to hold. In accumulating the evidence on the true history of the monastery, I have come to the conclusion that the monks of MHFM are only laymen and should never have declared themselves as a legitimate order of Saint Benedict, but rather they should have established themselves as an independent secular group denouncing Vatican II. It's not too late for them and those who follow them to reach this same conclusion. The diamond have usurped the Benedictine office they claim to hold and are now seen as the gurus of their sect. Simply put, the diamonds have usurped ecclesiastic authority and see themselves and are seen by their base as being gurus of sorts over their sect. Their displayed spiteful behavior has produced a spiteful base of followers, but it has also resulted in alienating countless others away from the true faith, producing at one extremist and at the other people discouraged in evangelism. Isn't that proof in itself that these laymen were not sent by Jesus Christ and that they did not properly follow the training required to avoid everything that is denounced here? It is wholly inadmissible that Michael Diamond speaks of re-establishing tradition in various sectors of Catholicism and not just those deemed dogmatic, such as adhering to the rule of fasting, but fails to accept the traditions related to the Order of Saint Benedict. He willfully turned a blind eye to the rule of the Code of Canon Law of 1917 or the teachings of Pope Leo XIII on the procedures to be followed to become a Benedictine superior. Just possibly, using Diamond's same arrogant logic, an MHFM supporter could purport that, this being the end times, he has the right to sleep on the surgeon's gown, reserved only for those who have first graduated from medical school and afterwards completed the lengthy surgical residency program, and intervene as a surgeon to try and save the life of a neighbor in dire need of professional medical assistance. Ludicrous, you say? Absolutely, but it's allegorical to the diamonds pretending to be Benedictine and save souls. Presumably, the diamonds apply the Benedictine rule where and when it suits them, and in so doing, they do their own will and not God's. In the links section, you will find another testimony from a person who also visited the monks, saying that the diamonds, in addition to the fact that they do not respect the rule of Saint Benedict, have within their Fillmore enclosure a huge building that holds a basketball court, complete with showers and a heated floor. A shot from Google Maps may perhaps identify this building in the vicinity of the address indicated on their website. The witness indicates the building has a white roof. One remains troubled and confused by the glaring inconsistency 
of how they live and worship and what their website conveys that the faithful should do during this end times phase of extreme urgency. Judging from their preferred religious lifestyle at the monastery, extreme prudence and careful reflection should be used before deciding upon donating to MHFM. As for me, I decided a long time ago not to give them any more of my money. As for you, well, you'll have to make up your own mind. The narratives from other people that are found in the links section may assist you making your final decision concerning donations. MHFM's video against Eastern Orthodoxy exposes the diamonds in their true light. They seek not the truth. I have actually run across individuals who believe that the monks of MHFM are living their cloistered monastic lives in a medieval-style monastery. What a disillusionment, isn't it? So, in view of the fact that I no longer support the Diamond Brothers of MHFM, what is my current position? Has there been a major change in the substance of my beliefs? In all honesty, I think not. I believe that I merely continued on in my search for the truth and have ended up at the doorstep of the only logical alternative to Sedevacantism, which is orthodoxy. A Sedevacantist can be best defined as being a halfway home orthodox. It is my opinion that John Pontrello's book, The Sedevacantist Delusion, honestly exposes the merits and the errors of the two major opposing traditional Roman Catholic camps, consisting of those disillusioned post-Vatican II Catholics who choose to resist the Pope but still recognizing him as being one, and those attacking the legitimacy of the Pope and the post-Vatican Church full throttle. But here's the thing, according to the teaching of Roman Catholicism, Sedevacantism is an act of both heresy and schism. I believe that the explanations I have provided for your consideration on papal supremacy, papal infallibility, are factual and conclusive. Above all else, they put into perspective an entirely different scale of observation in the analysis of the underlying problem using a holistic approach. Instead of accepting a false premise that Vatican II resulted due to a problem that arose a hundred years ago, the problem can be traced back to a millennium of bad theology affecting Catholic ecclesiology. On August 15, 2018, I went with a Cameroonian friend named Boris to attend a mass presided over by Father Marshal, a set of Acantis priests in southwest France. The abbot informed us to be in possession of the French version of Peter Diamond's book on salvation that he kept at home and professed to believe in its content. To say the least, great was our joy when he informed us during this trip of the existence of a bishop named Scharf, who would support the monks of MHFM and whose ordination was considered as being valid from the Bishop Tuck line. A few days later, we learned that Bishop Scharf did not actually support the monks but in reality openly condemned them. The latest news is that Bishop Scharf's community has since dissolved. Thus, as a result, you now find a number of young converts to Sedevacantism, thanks to MHFM, who are forced to remain in religious isolation because the diamonds do not actually provide any Benedictine after sale service, pastoral care, once a person buys into their religious scheme. What better confirmation is there that Jedi knows what he is talking about? This state of affairs is unfortunately the logical consequence of the Sedevacantist position, in my opinion. What I want to share with you is that leaving aside the religious community and liturgical aspect of the issue, my discussions with Boris will remain etched in my memory as being the trigger which drew my attention to the overall problem of Sedevacantism. My friend's manifested spiritual lucidity was such that even Father Marichal had, from the first day's meeting, mentioned the possibility of Boris becoming a priest. My Cameroonian friend taught me how to improve my prayers and made it clear that the monk's recommendation to pray the 15 decades of the rosary each day was not wise decision on their part. It is very interesting that his explanations of things resembled the orthodox hesychasm, minus having to stare at one's stomach. He instead spoke of staring a wall to help one's concentration, meditation. We also exchanged various criticisms about MHFM troubling evangelical, pastoral, ministerial practices, and everything discussed seemed to make sense and be spot on. For example, as mentioned above, there exists no concrete after-sales service with the diamonds. They sell false spiritual hope, along with the false promise of once converting to Sedevancantism of becoming a part of a robust united religious community. But the truth of the matter is, it is all smoke and mirrors. And then the issue of MHFM website came up, which Boris, myself and countless others find rather bizarre and confusing. The list of MHFM critic topics that came up for discussion went on and on. Boris had reproached me for being overly intellectual in my religious endeavors. It's amazing when I now think back to Jay Dyer's analysis on the subject, which I did not know about during that time. 
Boris shared with me the context surrounding his conversion to Sedevacantism. And all I can say is that the Holy Spirit is clearly actively working and as such provides evidence that we do not need the monks of MHFM to save us. If we think back to the Source African movie on the reception of the sacraments, made by my brother and friend Antoine, residing in Ivory Coast, Africa, the pastoral counsels that we gave constantly to converts shows that we were already orthodox without even realizing it. We managed to fill the serious gaps found in the monk's position without being able to authenticate them. We understood instinctively that there are numerous things, a long list of things, lacking within MHFM and or in urgent need of correction with pastoral care arriving at the top of the list. And concerning a question on salvation, what should we think of Roman Catholic saints such as Saint John Vianney or Padre Pio, and those declared as saints in Eastern Catholic Orthodoxy? I, for one, believe it is ludicrous to even consider the outside possibility that any of these declared saints found on either side reside in hell today. One Orthodox noted on this issue that Sedevacantis embrace the absurd proposition that only Roman Catholic saints are deified and the Orthodox saints are in hell. They hold this ridiculous position without ever having read or studied and reflected on the lives of Orthodox saints and comparing them with the lives of Roman Catholic saints. The Sedevacantis condemnation of Orthodox saints does not reflect the will of a just God. This same individual invited his Orthodox brethren to read and study and reflect on the life of Padre Pio and to apply the same reasoning. Having reflected and meditated on this issue, I believe that Roman Catholic heroes like Simon of Montfort, King St. Louis and Baldwin IV of Jerusalem displayed true Orthodox ideals in their sacrifice and service to Christ's Church and did not depart or retreat from defending traditional doctrinal teachings. Of course, these heroes were Christian soldiers, not astute theologians, and had not delved into trying to fully comprehend such things as the doctrine of the Trinity and the essence-energy distinction. Even Thomas Aquinas had no Greek text before him, he could very well have changed his mind if he had read the text of the Fathers on the subject. This meditation should already calm the frustrated assertions of the idealists among the Diamondites. It is not just the essence energy doctrine that the Diamonds and their followers would be well advised to familiarize themselves with. There must also be the inclusion of the Orthodox teaching on Theophanes and the Nous, the intelligence that each one of us possesses. The Latin Roman Church has lost and abandoned these two elements. When St. Paul speaks of body, soul and nous, it is apostolic confirmation of a tripartite vision of man, contrary to the finite vision of Roman Catholicism, which sees only of the heart and the intellect. The nous is the key to understanding our direct connection with God. This doctrine was however rejected by the Roman Church in favor of an Augustinian formulation, which places the death of Christ outside its celestial scope and reserving salvation exclusively for a select few. St. Maximus the Confessor developed this celestial-oriented topic in his book, and St. Paul speaks of it in chapter 8 of his letter to the Romans. In relation to salvation, Jedi explains in his article on Theophanes, individual persons are thus required to make use of their natural wills to participate in theosis or remain in the fallen state of death. There is every reason to believe the gospel is preached to all dead. In orthodoxy, there is no canard of what happens to people who never heard the gospel, which, in most classical Western theology, consigns them all to hellfire. When Christ triumphed over death, he triumphed over all death, which spread as a corruption through our nature. But not merely our nature, all of created reality. Christ conquered death and allowed everyone to freely enter theosis, the mystical union with God. Father Damascene, of St. Ehrman of Alaska Monastery in California says that for the Orthodox Church, salvation is more than forgiveness of sins and transgressions. It is not limited. For the fathers of the Church, salvation is the acquisition of the grace of the Holy Spirit. To be saved is to be sanctified and to participate in the life of God. Salvation means not simply changing God's attitude towards us, but changing ourselves and being changed by God. When one becomes aware of these stated facts, including the truth surrounding the error of papal supremacy, I do not see how one can continue to be troubled by the questions brought by the diamonds of MHFM. Excluding the heretical theory of universal salvation, it is clear that the diamonds' view on salvation does not coincide with rational, traditional Orthodox Catholic teaching. It is not heretical to state that only God can judge someone at the time of their death. It is not heretical to say that those who have lived just and moral lives and who have not had the opportunity to accept or reject Jesus as the Christ, such as a Muslim having lived righteously without scorning Jesus Christ, will be given the opportunity to freely make that choice. This Orthodox teaching explains that, God willing, those non-Christians who have lived almost according to faith and good works, without scorning Jesus Christ, will be presented with the facts surrounding his divinity 
and given the opportunity to accept or reject him, and so on. To keep it simple, if people seek the truth, they will find Jesus Christ. He left the church in the world, his own, it still exists. The teaching of this church is made accessible to the world still today. I invite my Catholic brothers and sisters to join Catholic Orthodox teaching. That being said, one must be wary of rushing headlong into the first Orthodox church just down the street, so to speak, hoping to find a heaven of peace. Many priests are convinced of the ecumenism, so dear to Vatican II and the Freemasons. A new convert to Orthodoxy may unfortunately find some Orthodox members that are hesitant to welcome them into their circle, even appearing a bit hostile to him and very rigid like the diamonds. Don't let this dissuade you. There are those who seem to forget to measure, as espoused by Saint Bernard of Clairvaux. Anyway, the one who loves Jesus will not be troubled and will be at the same level as a North Korean convert in the middle of the communist country. He will not have at all the same stress as his comrade converted to the Diamonds MHFM with its Donatist-based rules and ideals, who will commence his spiritual path within the unbridled fear of having to find absolutely such ordained priests in such a rite, something in which the Orthodox do not believe. I can only encourage you to learn more about Orthodoxy, which I have chosen and which I profess. I am a layman, not acting in the capacity of some supreme end times clerk. I have nothing to sell and I certainly do not seek to found a church on myself. I merely wish to convey that I firmly believe in the Orthodox and Apostolic Catholic Church, the only true Church of Jesus Christ on earth. I reject papal supremacy, papal infallibility and all the religious inventions that have resulted from this illegitimate bureaucratic regime. I decided not to delete the channel The Lily and the Cross as it does not contradict my current position. That channel was set up primarily with the intention of assisting those finding themselves at odds with religion in general terms. Finally, as already mentioned, Sedevacantists should simply call themselves Orthodox so as not to contradict the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church and remain consistent with their demands. The Great Mosaic can finally be displayed in the light of day. This work of elucidating certain darkened parts of that mosaic concerning the erroneous presuppositions on the validity of the papacy has allowed me to see more clearly now and to admire even more the beauty and the greatness of God, whom I praise and thank for ever and ever. Amen.